Welcome to Numerical Methods. So what I would like to do today is uh, yeah, gather all the stuff together that we created during the past sessions and discuss a little bit the implementation. So the title of today's section, yeah, and maybe also part of the next session is implementation. And I would like to discuss a little bit the abstraction of our mathematical concepts into interfaces. Yeah? So what are the right ways to cut the you know, interfaces? And then also discuss the implementations, Yeah, define call the corresponding classes. As an application, we will use the Monte Carlo simulation of the stochastic differential equation. That will be the topic of the next section. And the application is that I would like to value a European option with a Black Schultz model. So our implementation will combine all the stuff that we have discussed so far. Yeah, so recall we started with a very nice session on computer arithmetic. And there we learned that there could be rounding errors. And for example, if we calculate the sum of you know, the large amount of numbers yeah, to calculate, for example, an expectation, an average, we should consider maybe some error correction. This is the Kahan summation algorithm that will appear. Then we discussed the Monte Carlo method. So we had a convergence result telling us that we can approximate the expectation. Yeah, so here, mu is the expectation by our Monte Carlo sum. So this guy here, so actually recall that we used this guy by plugging in here a specific sample pass omega, so such that xi, capital xi of that omega, would be a random number sequence. So we had to discuss random number generation. For our model, I need a sequence of normal distributed random numbers. So I need our technique of generating random numbers of other distributions. I need, I need the inversion of the distribution function. And then maybe in the next session, I will also discuss the time discretization of stochastic processes again. So I will create an implementation of our uh, Euler scheme, of our Euler scheme here. Yeah, what I will need today is just the Brownian increment for a single step. Yeah, so it will be a kind of trivial Euler scheme. So I need the Brownian motion. Okay, so let's start with this uh, section on the implementation. And I would like to start with a few remarks on software design. Of course, you can have a full lecture on this. So um, actually the group I'm working with, these guys are brilliant mathematicians, yeah, people from physics, yeah, maybe engineers that are also brilliant programmers. Yeah? So um, it's important that you can combine the two skills because to have a good program that well realizes numerical algorithms, yeah, mathematical algorithms, you have to have knowledge from both sides. Yeah? So I would like to discuss now the abstraction of the mathematical concepts. And of course, you have to have an understanding of these mathematical concepts. So I would like to create classes and interfaces for these mathematical concepts. So actually the really important thing is the interface. I mentioned that some time ago. Interface is what can be done. Class is the actual implementation, how it is done. And for some algorithm, it is just enough to have some well, tool that tells me what can be done and I just combine these, these things. So I can implement then against an interface. So the question is then where to cut yeah, my problem, yeah, my big problem, for example, evaluation of a European option under the Black Schultz model using the Monte Carlo method, where to cut this into smaller parts so where should be the boundaries you know, for which we define the 
interfaces. So I should cut at the right boundaries. And this is maybe a little bit related to the single responsibility principle. Okay, so um, you, maybe you can also look these terms uh, up. Yeah, so there is also a nice Wikipedia page here for the single responsibility principle. So here it is, for example, stated a class should have only one reason to change. Yeah. For example, in our application, yeah, this could be that maybe you have a component that is responsible for generating the random numbers, yeah, the inversion of the distribution function, and maybe you would like to change this part. Yeah. So the class should just be responsible for a single part. So this is a principle that tells you a little bit that you should cut your program into smaller parts. Yeah. So it is pushing you into the direction to create more interfaces more finer classes. But there's also the opposite principle. So when you create a class or when you combine things together, you should check what are the quantities that should belong together. So this is then coherence. And I would like to have some high coherence. So things that belong together should be in the same place. And there's a really nice example for coherence here in our application. And this example is the drift and the numeraire. Yeah, why should these two things belong together? So the drift in your model, you know, would be a complicated function. It depends on the chosen equivalent martingale measure. The numeraire defines my equivalent martingale measure. So these two quantities, they both depend on the QN. Yeah. So they, they have an, they have a dependence. If you now implement your program and you have one part where you specify the drift and another part where you specify the numeraire, then it could be that you have inconsistent specifications. And so that could be an example for things that you put in a separate class. You know, for example, the class that encodes the information under which measure are you simulating you know, the measure. Okay, so these are some principles, there are many more. For example, if you look at the single responsibility principle on Wikipedia, you also find other principles here, the open close, the list of substitution principle. Open close is also a nice uh, principle. Yeah. So your class or module should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Yeah. So you should be able to extend your program, but maybe you should not modify the class in a way such that it behaves differently from its original intention. So it should be some kind of stable, you know, so not change, but it should allow extensions. So this is maybe the next thing um, you should think about. You should design your program for extension. And this is is also another uh, point where it is maybe an advantage that the good programmer is also a good mathematician. Because as a mathematician, maybe you already know a little bit what are poss possible or reasonable, yeah, the likely extensions that you should consider from the beginning. So consider, for example, mathematical generalizations and an example for this is that in black scholes model, if you move to log coordinates, it is an SDE with constant coefficients. So the drift is just R, the volatility is just sigma. Yeah? In log coordinates, the drift is R minus one half sigma squared. Um, so the drift is a scalar, the volatility is a scalar, but in more general models, drift and volatility are stochastic. So they could be functions of your state, which is then sigma is a random variable, 
Yeah? Or they could be stochastic processes of their own, yeah? which is then, for example, with the volatility as stochastic volatility model. So if you have the concept of a, an object that is stochastic, so instead of a floating point double, it is maybe a random variable, a vector of samples, yeah? a vector of doubles, you should immediately from the beginning implement maybe these two components in the way where the case of a scalar is just a special special case. So design the program for extension. And of course, you should you know, have a programming style such that your program is yeah, readable, concise. So it should be somehow self-documenting. I also try to exercise this with you. Yeah, when I do the live codings, I use very long variable names, yeah, number of time steps as a variable, yeah, and not something like NT, yeah, where you maybe have to think, okay, what is now NT? Um, so try to write in a way such that the program explains itself and uh, do not sacrifice too easily the readability over performance. Well, sometimes you think that writing a program in a in a more uh, yeah, self-documenting way is maybe uh, slower, but performance can be achieved in many ways. And also here we use the Java language. So the Java virtual machine does a lot of optimization under the hood. Yeah, for you. So sometimes you can write things in a way that you, looks a little bit less performant, but in the end it's as performant as the not so readable, cryptic, fast version would be. Okay, so these were just a few remarks and I would like to follow these things now. When I consider two application, so we will now illustrate this in two applications. So the first one is valuation of a European call option under the Black Shorts model. And the second one, which we will do then maybe in the next section, is the simulation of the Black Shorts model using the Euler scheme. Yeah, simulation of an SDE yeah. using the Euler scheme. Okay, so let's start with a first application, the first code session then. So valuation of the European call option under this Black Scholz model. Let's have a small recap of the steps we have to do and then try to implement this. So from the universal pricing theorem, I have that I can express today's value of a financial derivative. So this is here today's value of the financial derivative. I can express this as an expectation under the equivalent martingale measure of the future value of the financial derivative. So that's here the V of capital T, yeah, divided by the numerea at observation time this is now my N of capital T multiplied with the numerea at evaluation time. So I take the conditional expectation with respect to evaluation time if uh, evaluation time is at some little t. So for example, if now I have a model for a stock and I consider a European option, so my financial product is now a call option a call option on the underlying S with maturity capital T and strike K. So this is then that I will pay you the maximum of my stock S observed at capital T minus K, yeah, maximum of S minus K and zero. And that is then multiplied with my numerator ratio, so it is discounted, and I take the expectation with respect to f little t, f little bt being the evaluation time. So the green thing here is now the stuff that defines the financial product. It maybe that's already 
a thing where we should later cut yeah, our problem into separate separate parts. There is the financial product, the Asian option, European option, Bermudan option, whatever we would like to value. So this is here the function G. And then I have the model that generates my model quantities. These are the S and the numerea. Yeah. Numerea is also a stochastic process, initial value in little t given, yeah, it evolves up to capital T. So I can express the expectation as a function. The function is now the uh, given by the financial product, my G of the model quantities. So from that function, take the expectation. So this function G is the payoff function and it's a function of random variables. So I can maybe approximate now this thing using Monte Carlo integration. Yeah, to do this, I need to understand what is the S. So next step is the model. We use here a Black-Scholes model. The model for the numerea where we have just a bank account that accrues interest with an interest rate R. Uh, maybe initial value of my bank account in zero is one. So it's just e to the RT. And then I have the asset S and the asset S should follow a log normal process. Uh, so I know that the model for S is DS is under the equivalent Martingale measure RS DT plus sigma S dw, okay, initial value is in zero is s of zero. So then you know we had this session, if I would like to discretize this stochastic process, I could move to log s, and then I get an SDE with constant coefficients, so actually the time discretization scheme is the exact solution. So I do know the distribution of log of S of capital T, I do know that. Yeah, this is the initial value, the logarithm of the initial value, plus RT minus one half sigma squared coming from Ito's lemma, the minus one half sigma squared, plus sigma, and then integrate the Brownian increment. So my Brownian motion, W of T. So here the dark blue paths are actually my model parameters, initial value, R, sigma, these are my model parameters. And as an input, I need, of course, now my crown in motion. So this guy is normal distributed. So this is a random variable here, this guy is normal distributed with mean zero. and standard deviation square root of t. Take exponential on both sides, yeah, and you can express now your s of t. So I can plug in my s of capital T into my function g. Yeah, so I now have the tuple s of capital T and n of capital T divided by using my model parameters. So this is for the S, this is for the N, and everything depends here on my normal distributed random variable Z. So now you see I have written the square root of T in front. So by that, the Z is now a standard normal. This is the steps I need to do for the model. It's also just a function of a random variable. And now the random variable is just the Z, the standard normal. Yeah? And apart from this, it's a function of my model parameters, initial value, R and sigma. Yeah, combining all this 
stuff. Yeah, I can express the valuation in little t as the expectation of a function g, which is the financial product of a function h, which is which is the model that describes my model primitives, the stock and the numeraire of a random variable z. Yeah? So a function of a random variable z, z is normal distributed. So I can use now the Monte Carlo method to approximate this expectation. So we have the approximation that yeah, I just sample a normal distributed random variable z here. Yeah, a standard normal, and then I just plug in these random numbers into the function that is describing my model, and I plug it into the function that is describing my financial product, and I take the average, and I have an approximation of the value. So these are all these steps, yeah? So maybe you could do Kahan summation here to improve the accuracy of the summation algorithm. And let's have a small code session and uh, implement this. So what I will do first, I will just implement it in a, say, very classical way. Yeah. So don't use interfaces and classes. Yeah? Don't do not use too many things. Just implement it straightforwardly using a single loop. And you know, then I would like to move more and more to a design where we introduce interfaces and classes. So code session exercise, implement the valuation of a European option under the Black Scholes model. And we will use uh, our Mersenne twister to generate uniform random numbers. And then all the stuff that I listed in the introduction, yeah, inversion of the distribution function and so on. Okay, so let's create a new package here in our repository. So maybe have a, lengthy name, yeah, Monte Carlo valuation. Let's create a class. And this is Monte Carlo Black Scholes call option um, experiment. I would like to have a main method. And maybe I define all my parameters here as members of the class. So I will instantiate the class to have the members. So what do we need? So the first thing I need are maybe my model parameters. So I have an initial value. So maybe I, I start with 100. My stock is at 100. I have a risk-free rate, my R. So maybe my R is 5%. Yeah. Okay, so this is the R. This is the S0. Um, what else do we have in the model? I have the sigma. So this is my volatility. Maybe volatility is 20%. So these are the parameters of my model. I have a financial product I would like to value. So let's have a financial product. So the financial product has a maturity. So this is my option maturity. So maybe it is in one year. Yeah, so... I start in zero, capital T is one, and I have a strike, the K. So this is the strike. Yeah? So let, let's take 105, yeah? but this is my K, this is my capital T. So I do not use T, K, and so on. I use rather long names. If I would like to uh, simulate the stochastic process, yeah? so then, I would have a time discretization. Then I would have the parameters initial time. So I start in zero. So this is my little t on the slides, the evaluation time. And uh, I would like to have a time stepping in my numerical scheme. So this is just the number of time steps. But actually here I know the exact solution. So I just need a single time step. I just have a single time step. You also have this here on the slide. 
you see that this here is a numerical scheme with a single time step. Yeah? Starting in zero, I immediately step to capital T. Actually, I see there is a little bit of typo here. Yeah, So this little t here is actually this one. So maybe one should state here a bit that this is the little t, right? So otherwise, you would have a t minus capital T also here. So then I would like to do Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo I need to do because there is the W of T, the Brownian motion. So I need for my random number generator, I need a seat, a random number seat. And I also need yeah, the number of samples. Yeah, number of sample paths or number of samples. I will later explain that our Brownian motion is actually can be a multi-factor one and uh, my Black Scholz model is just a single factor model. So later we will also have a parameter number of factors. Yeah, This is actually now uh, one. Yeah? So this is the deep dimension of the Brownian motion. But I will comment this just later. So how many sample paths do we need? You know, maybe take 20 million. Okay, so this is a two times 10 to the power of seven. Yeah, let's start with maybe these parameters and check the evaluation of a European option under these uh, parameters. Maybe I also like to print a little bit about the performance. How long is the calculation? Yeah, how, how much time does the calculation need? So I will use these two variables here to measure the time. And I mentioned, yeah, I have created all my parameters now as members. So I need to instantiate this class. So let's instantiate this class. This is my experiment. And I create a new instance of this experiment. Okay, so let's start our calculation. So I record the current system milliseconds. And the first thing I would like to do is I would like to calculate it analytically because there's a Black Schultz formula that allows me to calculate this value analytically. So this is the value analytic. And let's implement then later a method that calculates this analytically. Then check how long this took and maybe have some nice printout of the result. So my result is now the analytic value. Okay, so this is just the value that we print and maybe we also print in a bracket the time we took. No? So how long did it take? So this is time end minus time start. And these are milliseconds. So let's divide this by 1000. Then we have this in seconds. Okay, so he's complaining that he does not have such a method. Yeah value analytic that's created. And I do not know, I do not need to implement now the whole analytic formula. There is one in our financial mathematics library. Yeah, there is a package functions here and in functions you have, oh, not, not there. So there is one here in the package functions. So in functions you have analytic formulas and there is all kinds of Black Scholes and other model analytic formulas. So let's use that guy. So let's use analytic formulas from this library and let's use Black Scholes option value. So he will the he likes to have the initial stock value, the risk free rate, the volatility, the option maturity, the option strike. Okay, these parameters fit. 
let's run our program. Let's see what we get. Okay, 8.02 yeah, in you know, a tenth of a second. So now let's try and value the financial product using Monte Carlo. Yeah? So I copy maybe this block here. Okay, so this is now the value Monte Carlo. And I would like to just use a classical loop. Yeah, so that's okay. So let's create a function value Monte Carlo using loop. And in my printout here, I also write Monte Carlo value using just the classical for loop. Okay, and create this method. Okay, so how is this done? Yeah, I would like to do Monte Carlo, so I need a random number generator. So my random number generator, you see I now have many different implementations of an interface random number generator. And what I will do now in this exercise, I will always use the implementation from this library. Yeah. So this is the implementation we did in the lecture, which is actually the same as in the library. And this is the implementation we have in the library. I will always use now the components from this library. So this is my random number generator. And uh, which one will we use? Let's use Mersen Twister. So there is a implementation of Mersen Twister, an implementation of Mersen Twister that uses our seed parameter. So now I have a random number generator. Then I need the sum to aggregate yeah, all the pathwise valuations. So initialize the sum. So now loop over. So these are now all my sample indices. So from zero sample indices go to number of samples. So iterate over all sample index. Well, I do not need the sample index, but I just need the loop. So the first thing is I draw a uniform a uniform random number. I draw the uniform from my random number generator. So there is a, give me a floating point double. Then I transform it to a normal. Yeah, I transform it to the normal using our inversion of the distribution function. So there is an inverse of the distribution function here. So, and this is applied to the uniform to get a normal distributed random number. And then I calculate the S of T. So this is now my stock or my underlying, if you like. So my underlying is, you know, now I use the formula which we had here on the slide. So Z is now my normal. I would like to calculate the S of capital T. So my underlying is the initial value multiplied with the exponential of Okay, now it is the drift, yeah, so it is the risk-free rate, minus one-half sigma, so the volatility squared. Yeah, all this, sorry. So all this now multiplied with the time step size, yeah, so the time step size is just the option maturity. So if you like option maturity minus initial time. This is the drift part. Okay, so maybe I can move this here. This is the drift part. And now I have plus, I have a normal, so it is plus volatility multiplied with square root of time step size, so the square root of this time step times the normal. So hopefully this should be now the implementation of here our, whoops, this should be now the implementation of here our formula for S in, as a function of the set. Next thing is I would like to calculate the discounted payoff. So next thing is I would like to calculate the discounted 
payoff. Yeah, payoff. The payoff is the maximum of S minus K. So underlying minus option strike. Huh? Maximum of this and CR. This is the payoff. And this counted payoff is that I multiply with the exponential minus R yeah, and multiplied with, again, the time step option maturity minus initial time. Yeah? Option maturity because initial time is just zero. So this is now my discounted payoff. And then we just sum this up. So my sum of values is just the sum of all those discounted payoffs. And I return the sum divided by the number of samples. That should be it. Uh, I hope I didn't do anything wrong. Ah, error says exist. Okay, it, there is an error, of course, here. Yeah, this R is just my risk-free rate, yeah? So I like to use long variable names, so this R is the risk-free rate. Ah, okay, that looks good. Yeah, we have uh, 10 to the power of seven sample paths, yeah? So the square root would be uh, 10 to the power of three. So there should be a difference at the third digit approximately, yeah? So it is order of magnitude eight, yeah? So the relative error, so this is the first one, second, third one, yeah? So it's accurate up to three, three digits. So relative error, 10 to the minus three. Yeah, so that's, that is uh, in line with what we had for the convergence rate for the Monte Carlo method. Okay, you see, this is perfectly okay here, but everything is a little bit clued together. Yeah, so I have a separate class that is generating the random numbers nicely, the uh, uniform random number generator. But apart from that, Everything is here a little bit clued together. I try to decouple it a little bit. Here's the model, here's the payoff, yeah. But okay, everything is inside uh, this loop. Let me show you a second way of implementing this uh, using Java streams. So maybe I just duplicate now this here. So, and I call this now value Monte Carlo using, say, streams. Okay, so get value Monte Carlo using stream, streams, and maybe I just print this result. Okay, I need to implement this method here. And yeah, we will start uh, very similar. Yeah, I have a random number one D yeah, I use, but now I can generate a sequence of these random numbers. I just can generate a double stream. Yeah, a double stream is just an uh, abstraction of the concept of a sequence. And yeah, I have a stream that is the sequence of the uniforms. So there is a method that allows me to generate a sequence of uniforms out of my random number generator. I would like to have a finite sequence. So if I would like to have a finite sequence, I can call here limit and I limit it to the number of samples. So this is now a finite sequence of these uniforms. And now the nice thing of these streams is that I can transform them into other streams. So I would like to transform it into another stream. And this is, I apply, maybe I should fix this typo here. This is, I apply to this stream of uniforms. I apply a function to it. This is a double unary operator. And the function I would like to apply is the inverse of the cumulative distribution function. So this is now my normal distribution from the library and from that the inverse cumulative distribution function. So this is just the sequence UI. And this here is the sequence XI is F of UI. Yeah? And this here is the F. And now I can use this principle of transforming using two um, operators. 
This is a double unary operator. So unary operator, operator of one argument that maps double to double. And yeah, which operator do we have? This is now my model. So my model maps the normal, which is the Z, to the S. And now comes exactly this function here that maps the normal to the S. Okay, so this is now my um, function. Okay, I used the word normal already for this for the stream. So let's use here the here the word uh, set. So this is a function that maps set to exactly this. Yeah, s zero times exponential r t minus one half sigma square t plus sigma square root of t z. This is my function h one. And in the same way, I can define now the double unary operator, which is my product. So this is my product. Yeah, my product is the discounted payoff here. Okay, so if you like, you could have two functions, one being the product payoff, and then another function being the discounted. I'll make both steps here in yeah, in one step. So I map now the underlying to the pathwise discounted value. Yeah, that, now I can apply these two functions to my stream. So, and my value is take the stream of normal distributed random numbers, apply the model, apply the product, and from that, take the average. And I would like to have that as a floating point double number. Okay, so this code here looks much cleaner. And we have a little bit already separate, separated the two aspects, model and product, into functions, yeah, which maybe we could exchange. Let's return the value. Okay, so maybe let's run this guy now. Hopefully I did everything right. Okay, so this looks very nice. Yeah? It's a bit slower, no? okay? But the code looks, to me, it looks a little bit cleaner. We separated the numerical method of random number generation. We have a function for the model, a function for the product, and we are then calculating here the combined function, and then the average. You see that actually I do not get the same value as here above. Okay, but I have the same random number generator in both examples, and they have the same seed. So in theory, I should get the same value, right? So why are the two values here different? So the thing is that the implementation of this average here, this uses an error correction. So for example, if you take here sum instead of average yeah, and divide by the number of samples, you get the same result. So I do the expectation, the averaging now by first summing. And then if you hover here over sum, you see here a remark that the math method may be implemented using compensated summation yeah, or other technique reducing the error. So, and this implementation actually uses a compensation, this uses Kahan summation. So that's the reason why this value is a little bit different from that one. Yeah, these are now two variants of implementing this. And my next step is I would like to introduce interfaces and classes that we can reuse in other models, other applications. So what are now good things to yeah, isolate into an interface? So you, you see, for example, the generation of the Brownian increment. So actually our Z, or actually this is the square root of time steps time set. So this is maybe a thing that could go to um, a separate class. 
or the concept of a random variable, yeah, so such that we can actually avoid always iterating over all the sample paths. Because what you see is we could also write this here in terms of random variables. This is what we had on the slide. You see that this equation here, it's a function in terms of random variables. This object is a random variable, so this is a random variable. Yeah. So in your numerical scheme, you can write everything in variable in, in terms of random variables. You already know that this is meant to be pathwise. The implementation we did was that we did this pathwise. So we could introduce a level of abstraction by introducing ram random variables and write all formulas in terms of random variables. So we can actually get rid of all this looping. And we have the code that calculates the expectation in a single place. So I will continue this code session with the Monte Carlo valuation of a European option. Yeah, I will continue this. There will be a second part where we will use the classes and interfaces that we are creating now. If you want to have a look, you can you find this here in our uh, lecture repository in this uh, package. So let's introduce a few interfaces and classes, time discretization, random variables, Brown in motion. So what we will frequently need is a time discretization. So I didn't need this here for the valuation on the Black-Scholz model because there I know the analytic solution and I just need one time step, but later I need a time discretization to construct my Euler scheme. And all the quantities we work with are actually random variables. So maybe a good thing is to have a random variable, a random variable X, but since X is actually a stochastic process, the random variable is X of Ti, the random variable is associated a little bit with the time. So I have a family of random variables on that time discretization. And a prominent example is my Brownian increment, my delta W of Ti, a Brownian increment from Ti to Ti plus one. Yeah, so W of Ti plus one minus W of Ti. So this is my Brown in motion. For a random variable, I would like to define all kind of operations. Yeah. So for example, I have a pathwise operator. So this means I have an operation which is defined on uh, the image space of the random variable. So for example, if, if it is a real valued random variable, we have real valued random variables here. It is an operator defined on the real numbers. So it's this operator here. It could be plus, minus, yeah, take the sum of two random variables, yeah, whatever. And this operator is then lifted to the random variable. I can, can take the sum of two random variables and everything is understood uh, pathwise. So I have an operator here on my random variable. There are some operators which are non-passwise where I combine values that the random variable has on different paths. For example, the expectation operator, uh, I take the sum over all sample paths and divide by the number of sample paths uh, if I have a finite number of sample paths. So this non passwise operator can be then understood. Also, the result is random variable. It is random variable that is constant on all omega. So actually, the expectation operator is an operator that maps a random variable on a random variable, but the random variable is constant. So it would be a random variable unary operator, yeah? an operator on one argument and create another random variable. 
I have binary operators, uh, take the sum of two random variables, uh, and so on. Time discretization, I would like to create maybe an interface for a time discretization that tells me what can be done with a time discretization and then have an implementation. So I have, for example, a time discretization from T0 to Tn. What I need is maybe a map that gives me for every time index the time or for every time index the time step. This is something I very I need very often in the order scheme, for example, yeah? square root of delta ti uh, or drift times delta ti. And there are also some functions that are often useful, for example, for a given time, find the next time index in the time discretization that is smaller or equal the given time. Time discretization and random variables. I have a very prominent example. Yeah, this is the Brownian motion, let's say the time discrete Brownian motion, or to be precise, it's actually the delta W Ti. So I have a random variable on my time discretization. So the delta W Ti's, they are mutually independent and normal distributed with mean zero and standard deviation squared of delta ti. Maybe that's also a thing yeah, that I could pack into a class yeah, and then define an interface. What is a Brownian motion? What is a time discrete Brownian motion? Yeah, a time discrete Brownian motion is something that has a time discretization and provides for time indices random variables. So now I would like to design for extension. And I do know that many models have a vector value, Brownian motion, as the driver. Uh, Black Schultz just has a single Brownian motion, a one-dimensional Brownian motion. But for example, the Heston model, where the stock has a Brownian increment and the volatility is a stochastic process that also has a Brownian increment, this has a two-dimensional Brownian motion. So I need as an extension, I need an M factorial Brownian motion. So this means delta W of Ti is actually a vector of normal distributed random variables. So a normal distributed vector with normal distributed components where the components are mutually independent. So you see, I have here now a vector W1, W2, Wm. So I have Brownian increments, delta W1 for the first component, delta W2 for the second component. All these guys evaluated on my time discretization. So I will implement a little bit more general an M factorial Brownian motion. I know for the Black Scholz model, I do not need it for the Euler scheme. Actually, I know that for the Black Scholz model for the Euler scheme, I do not even need the time discretization, but I design everything a little bit for extension. I design a, a general time discretization and Brownian, Brownian motion. So let's do that. So let's define the abstraction. What can be done with these things? So these are now my interfaces. And then also implement. Uh, actually, I have an implementation, so I will just shortly, very quickly go through this with you. How we do it, so implement classes that implement these interfaces. So the interfaces I would like to define are those for the concepts I have just introduced. So there's the random variable, the time discretization and the crown in motion. Okay, so maybe we start just looking at these interfaces. So now I go to our library and this library provides all kinds of nice numerical algorithms. And 
Let's start with the random variable. So there is an interface random variable defined here. And you see this interface now specifies what can be done with a random variable. For example, I can add a floating point number, a constant to a random variable. I can subtract a floating point number from a random variable. There's also here the function floor, which is maybe quite useful to us. So this applies x is mapped to maximum of x and floor. So if x is s minus k, I just say floor zero uh, to apply the maximum function. So this is maybe quite useful. I can multiply the random variable with a constant. There are also methods that are now operators between two random variables. So to this random variable, I can add another random variable. The result is then always the new random variable that defines the result. So this applies x plus the given random variable to this random variable, and it returns a new random variable with the result of the function. Yeah. So this is everything is using here immutable objects. So I do not modify the object. I always create a new object that contains the results. Yeah? The immutable object is a quite good technique, especially if you want to implement your code thread safe. So what else should a random variable allow me to do? Of course, I need to apply some functions, exponential, square root, squared, logarithm, whatever. You can apply functions. So these are all the arithmetic operations. These are all the passwise operators. And I also have, of course, the average yeah, or the expectation, yeah, which is just a synonym. So I can calculate the expectation. If I calculate the expectation, I get back an, another random variable. So this random variable is now a random variable that is constant. And for a random variable that is constant, there is a method that allows me to extract the floating point value. So let's have a look at the implementation. So you can go to open type hierarchy. And if you open the type hierarchy, you see that all these guys here now implement the random variable. So there is, for example, a random variable from double array. If you peek into this, you see this is just a vector of realizations. And if you now look how, for example, the add function is implemented, it is just implementing our loop, looping over all elements of the given random variable, calculating the sum, the sum of the given random variable and the given number. And this result is written into a new vector. And from this new vector, a new random variable is generated. And actually, you see that there's a small optimization hidden in this implementation. Because this implementation can decide, is this just a random variable that is a constant? So it has always the same value. Then actually he doesn't loop over the array. There is just a single value and he's just performing this addition on the scalar. So this random variable implementation hides from us the ability that a random variable could be a scalar. So if you go back here, you see that the data model actually has a vector for the case when the random variable is not deterministic, and it has a scalar for the case when the random variable is deterministic. So in that case, this here is just null. Huh? So this allows me to implement all algorithms that use a scalar in terms of the random variable without wasting space. Huh? And in later cases, I can just replace the parameter that was a scalar with something that is stochastic. This implementation here using a uses an array of floating point doubles. This implementation here using an array of floating point single precision numbers. So it uses half the memory. Yeah, If you use 100 million sample paths, this could be maybe relevant in your model. And there are other implementations. There's also an extension of the interface that allows algorithmic differentiation, 
backward and forward algorithmic differentiation, yeah, a numerical technique. So you see, I have different implementations here. And these different implementations implement now the behavior described here in my interface, yeah, that I can add a number to a random variable or I can add to random variables. Maybe I have another good experiment with the random variable and we play a little bit with this. So let's create maybe a new package, Monte Carlo random variable. And let's have a small random variable experiment. Okay, let's have a main method. And I would like to do the following exercise. Construct two different random variables using the two different implementations, the double precision and the single precision implementation, and calculate from your random variable expectation of x and expectation of x squared. Yeah. So if you would like to have a look, this is here the random variable experiments in our repository in this this uh, package here. Let's do this very, very quickly. Yeah. So I would like to have a random variable. So this is now my interface. Yeah. This is the random variable double precision. So I create now a new random variable. And now I have to select my specific implementation. So I take this implementation. You see the arguments, they have a argument time here. So the random variable is associated with the time, the filtration time, if it is a stochastic process. So this is actually not relevant here for us. And then comes the realization vector. So let's take the realization vector. So this is now a vector of floating point numbers. So what do we take? Uh, maybe I take one third, minus one third. Maybe I take Again, minus one third and two third. So the expectation is zero, right? Okay, I would like to print expectation of X and expectation of X squared. So I would like to print this of this random variable. And the nice thing is that I now have an implementation that only takes something that implements random variable. So it's agnostic with respect to which implementation was used. Yeah, I operate now on random variables. So let's have a expectation. So this is, I take the random variable and I take the expectation this is a random variable, so I take the floating point value. So I can print the expectation. So this is my E of X. This is my expectation. Let's calculate the expectation of X squared. So this is my random variable. I perform arithmetic operations. Yeah, I can multiply it with itself. I can also just call squared take the expectation, take the floating point value and just print this. So this is now expectation x squared. So maybe we run this. Uh, okay, so this is expectation is zero. This is expectation x squared. So this is now what we get if I use, so let's print which class was injected here in the function. So I can just print here, random variable, get class, get simple name. Then he will print which class was used, which implementation was used. Again, this function here doesn't know which implementation is created here. So you see he's using the floating point double implementation. And now I can just repeat this. So let's repeat it. This is now the single precision. 
value, I use the other implementation. I use the implementation that takes the float array. And I inject this one. I inject this into my function that prints now the moments. Okay, and you see that you have a different implementation injected. You get a different, slightly different value you know, because the floating point of single position doesn't have that many, many digits. The technique I was using here is called dependency injection. So the algorithm that calculates the expectation of X and expectation of X squared, this depends on the specific implementation you know, we used. So I can inject different implementations of my random variable interface. So an example for the dependency injection here was for the random variable that I had two different implementations. I had an implementation using double precision floating point number, and I had an implementation using single precision floating point numbers. So different implementations for this interface exist. And if you write your code in terms of these interfaces, you can inject uh, the different implementations. I also have implementations where the random variable are then evaluated on a GPU or they use algorithmic differentiation. So the next thing I would like to do is the time discretization. So a time discretization that makes it easier to work with time. Yeah, this is a little bit trivial. So there is an interface for the time discretization, which is here. And you see, this is the stuff I can do with the time discretization. I can get for a given index, the given time. I can ask for the number of times in my time discretization, the number of time steps, which is just number of times minus one. I can get a given time step for a given index, the delta ti. And there are some useful things like get the index the nearest, less or equal, the function that I had on the slide. Yeah, So this function that is the maximum yeah, of the T of the i's where t i is less or equal, little t. We also have an implementation for our time discretization. Here is an implementation. So the implementation has several constructors that are quite useful. So this is for convenience. You can create a time discretization, for example, from a given initial, the number of time steps and the time step size, you know, a convenient way to construct time discretizations. So now I have the two concepts, random variable and time discretization, and I can define the Brownian motion. So let's have a look how the Brownian motion looks. So in Monte Carlo, there is an interface that tells me what are the things I can do with a Brownian motion, or what can a Brownian motion provide? So a Brownian motion has a time discretization because this is a time discrete Brownian motion. So I can ask this time discrete Brownian motion, what is your time discretization? And if I know the time discretization, then I can ask the Brownian motion, give me the Brownian increment at the given time index. And since I do a multi-factor Brownian motion, an m-factorial Brownian motion, so I implement here this vector. So therefore I have two arguments. I have the argument i, the index, the time index, and I have the argument j, the factor index. Yeah, so these are the argument i and the argument j, and I get back a random variable. Okay, these are the two relevant functions here, the Brownian increment and the time discretization. Yeah, there are some uh, synonyms here, or there is also a method where you can plug in a floating point time, and he's then asking the time discretization for the corresponding index. You can also ask for the number of factors or the number of 
sample pass, yeah, but this is maybe a bit for convenience. The problem motion also can generate a random variable for a given constant, like a factory mode method, but yeah, that's not so important. So this is our interface for the Brownian motion. And there should be now some implementations. So you can open the type hierarchy. So you see there is a Brownian bridge, a special version of the Brownian motion. Uh, there is a Brownian motion from Mersenne random numbers. And there is a Brownian motion that uses a dedicated random number generator. So the constructor takes the time discretization, the number of factors, the number of sample paths, the random number generator. And it also takes a random variable factory that tells me which implementation of random variable should be used to wrap my generated random numbers. So by this, you can now inject different implementations of the random variable into this implementation of the Brownian motion. If you look in random variable factory, random variable factory is also just an interface, an interface that has just a method that creates a random variable out of a sample vector. And if you open the type hierarchy of this, you see that you see that I have one implementation that generates my single precision guy, uh, and I have another implementation yeah, that can create the double precision guy. Uh, or actually, it can create both depending on which Boolean you use here. So this, this is my constructor for the Brown in motion. Let's have a look how it is implemented. So there is the get brown in increment. The get brown in increment will check if the increments have been pre-calculated. So it will use lazy initialization. If these increments have been pre-calculated, it just returns the random variable for the given time and the given factor. If not, it generates the brown in motion. And it generates the brown in motion using here our inversion of the distribution function. So you see, I have one component random number generator for the uniform. The inversion of the distribution function is here in the Brown in motion, time discretization, all the components. So now I have these three things, and maybe I can repeat our little exercise um, from the beginning and use these guys to implement the valuation of the European option. So I return to our experiment. So let's return here to our experiment and have a last one for today. So this is value Monte Carlo using, say, using random variables. Okay, so maybe make it a bit nicer. So I print this value and I need to implement this method. I need a random number generator. Mersenne Twister is a random number generator in one dimension, okay. Then from my random number generator, I can generate the Brown in motion once I have the time discretization. So my time discretization is now a new time discretization and I use the constructor that allows me to create it with the initial time, number of time steps and the time step size. Well, time step size is just the option maturity divided by the number of time steps. Well, actually to be precise, it's option maturity minus initial time divided by number of time steps, but initial time is zero. So that's my time discretization. Now I can create my Brown in motion. I use now my Brown in motion 
with the given random number generator. No, it has a time discretization. So time discretization, number of factors. This is number of sample paths. Where's my number of sample paths? Number of samples. And the random number generator. What's he complaining? Ah, this is an integer. Okay, maybe use int here. So now we have constructed these three guys. So now I can ask the Brownian motion to give me the Brownian increment. So this I just call my diffusion. So this is the Brownian motion. Get Brownian increment for the time index zero. I just have a one-dimensional on motion. So this is my delta W of zero. Just to recall, I now like to implement this function here, where this here is the delta W yeah, of T yeah, or of zero. This is my prone increment. So my diffusion is multiplied with sigma. The drift is added. I take the exponential. I multiply with the initial value. So I have the drift. The drift is R minus one half sigma squared. So maybe I'd be lazy and, and just copy it from here. So this is the drift. So then I have the underlying. So the underlying is now my delta W. This is multiplied with the volatility. Then I add the drift. Then I take the exponential. And then I add the initial value. So this is now the model. This is my S of zero. Then I have my payoff. So my payoff, say also the discounted payoff. The discounted payoff is now take the underlying, subtract the strike. So maximum of S minus K. So subtract the strike. Take the maximum of this and zero. So this is floor at zero. And now discounting means I multiply with exponential minus R T, no? actually minus R times step size. So the value should be the expectation of this. So the value is the payoff discounted, the expectation, and from that, the double value. So this is now the implementation using the random variable. So you see that this is yeah, a bit more lengthy than the stream one. But we got rid of this loop. All this loop is now hidden in the random variable. And maybe we can still make this a bit cleaner. And I will make this cleaner in the next session when we nicely separate model and product. But a little bit, this is already encapsulating a few concepts that will be reused. So let's have fingers crossed and hopefully the code is correct. No, what's wrong? This cannot be the error, but what is the error? Initial time. Ah, uh, sorry, this is not. Okay, so there's the error. This is not at the initial value, right? This is multiply with the initial value. Okay, so this is not, this is log Euler scheme. Yeah, so this is multiply with the initial value. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, and you see it's uh, a bit faster than the thing with the streams, Yeah, uh, a bit slower than the direct loop. And I get the same value as for the stream because the expectation here, if you take a look into this implementation, uses Kahan summation. So if you go back to our random variable, the implementation of my random variable so, for example, the double precision one, which was here, if you have a look into the way we are implementing the average, 
this is this is using Kahan summation, the thing that we did in our very first session yeah, on computer arithmetic. So I use also here Kahan summation. So let's continue on this with the next session. So this is what we did, review interfaces and implementations for the random variable for the time discretization for the Brownian motion. And in the script, you find also two remarks which I made in between. First remark, immutable objects. So my random variable is an immutable object. So that means whenever you have an operation on it, it creates a new object with the result. So you cannot write here that you just want to multiply the x with some value. You have to assign the result to a new value. So you have to be careful for this. Using immutable objects is a very good technique. It's less error prone because you do not modify the state of the object. And the second uh, remark here on my random variable, I carry also the filtration time. So don't be confused by this. Yeah? So sometimes this is uh, helpful, though the, the random variable knows the time if it is related to a stochastic process. And then we had our little session where we played on random variables. So that was part two. Yeah, we also did this guy. So part two, implement now the Black Schultz valuation using these three things. And next session, I will continue on defining models and the numerical scheme, the Euler scheme. That was it for today. Thanks.